Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and sports nutrition professor of, oh, 17 years, I think. And I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. Yeah, this is Phil Stevens. I run Strength Guild. I am a powerlifting games athlete and a bunch of other stuff. So. Hey, this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson, exercise physiologist, owner of Extreme Human Performance, and a faculty member at the Kerrig Institute for Functional Neurology. Sweet. Yeah. All right, folks, we've got the usual news. We've got mail. You know, things just happen. Uh, And then after the break, we're going to talk about supplements that work, in this case, sleep aids. There's many choices out there, and we are just fussing recently that maybe sleep doesn't get enough attention. So there you go. All right. Uh, The first bit of news. Strength and muscle sport news. This is uh, from a friend of mine through Facebook, Katie, but she said, um, Hi, Lonnie. I hope you're well. I wanted to get your opinion, if I could, on creatine. Uh, I have a friend whose son plays baseball and wants to add muscle mass. He is 15 years old, 149 pounds, and 5'11". Is there a dose or brands that you would recommend? And again, Katie from Facebook. My response to her was this, and I don't know how you guys would differ, but here we go. I said, uh, hello, there are well over 300 studies documenting creatine safety and efficacy in adults, but much less on teens. Uh, I can only say that if my own young man wanted to try it to boost his athletic power uh, or gains, I would allow it after we discussed uh, that it's just a non-essential nutrient, right? The body treats like carbohydrates, um, but also what his intent was, right? Including maybe some of the ethics of performance enhancement. Uh, because you wouldn't want him to mention something at school, for example, and have people say, oh, that's a steroid, and that's performance enhancing. So it's probably a good idea to talk about the nature of what's within the rules versus one-upsmanship and things like that. But anyway, I said um, creatine has become pretty cheap and ubiquitous, making it less risky uh, for fakes and things with cut-in contaminants. Most brands, I would think, are fine. I get cheap straight creatine monohydrate. Nothing extra, none of the fancy creatines. Uh, I get it on Amazon from a company called On. Uh, one tablespoon or five grams daily for a month is what I would suggest for uh, someone in his mid-teens. Uh, Phil, have you ever come into this this discussion before? Yeah, um, a bit. And I agree with what you're saying. I mean, the biggest part is most of them, most of them don't need anything except for just to set good habits. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll try and mess with them with their eating a little bit, but I don't even push that too hard as a teen. It's just trying to eat good food, and really, it's not even dealing with them. It's dealing with their parents. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that's the tough part. Is like they have, they have little control over it. Um, when well, it depends on what age you're talking. But I'm dealing with some like eight, nine year olds even, and uh, so yeah, I mean, I don't have any problem with it. But I mean, it's it's the last step on things that I care about. You know, right. I'm looking to set a habit of coming into the gym and, you know, eat some good food and rest and, you know, yeah. so, but yeah, I mean, I essentially wouldn't have a problem. Like if my daughter wanted to start taking it, yeah, let's do it. You right. Know. I mean, her, her yeah. training's in place. She's eating three yeah. or four big meals a day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, so no, it's a good point. There's nothing magical about it. When you look at what if creatine can give you an extra 10% in power output or something like that, mm-hmm. a lot of youth, they can make much bigger leaps and gains just through training and getting enough sleep and getting their their diet in order and stuff like that i would think but, yeah yeah uh, what about you dr nelson yeah i mean i agree with all that um i think it's a more interesting argument sometimes when you have parents who cause kids are playing in this case it was baseball which you know can be a contact sport um but when their kids are playing like american football and then you've got parents that seem to be just you know, violently against creatine, which has some data more so in animals than humans so far, just because we're not going to take a bunch of humans and whack them on the head and dissect them and see what happens. But 
that creatine in higher doses, uh, we saw Turner Polsky talk about this at ISSN a couple of years ago too, um, may actually help with slight protection against maybe impact or concussion or trauma or things of that nature. Don't know exactly how much in humans yet, but like you said, Lonnie, there's really almost no downsides that we've seen. It's by far and away the most um, studied nutrient for especially sports supplementation. And so I think it's kind of interesting sometimes how parents are violently against creatine, but yet they're letting, you know, Johnny run into some other human at full speed for years on end, which seems to be <laughs> more of an issue. Yeah, more I think, abusive. Than yeah. Worrying about um, creatine itself. Right on. Yeah. But, I but think it's the gateway drug. Right. Oh, See, yeah. Now, it is worth, I think it is worth a conversation. If you've got a, a, a young lady or young man and they're very serious about sports, they, they're starting to get stuff in place. They're looking at this stuff. That's why I brought up some of the ethics of performance enhancement. I think it's worth yeah. it's worth at least discuss. Like, are you doing this because you just got your ass handed to you and you're trying to do some one upsmanship here and sort of work around, or is this just part of a, a recovery and nutrient plan? You know, there's a healthy way to look at this versus. Uh, well, and you know, and I I know you're kind of laughing, Phil, and I I agree, but you wouldn't want it to be something where they. You know, it depends on their outlook on the whole thing. You know, like they're trying to use this as a crutch or they're doing this instead of harder training or they're, um, I don't know, they're uh, almost looking at it as if it were some dangerous performance enhancer and they still want to take it. You know, those are some of the things I think you got to, uh, just a, a teaching moment there, maybe. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, I just joked about gateway drug, but I mean, that's in a way how it can be seen as a gateway drug, just the misinformation about it. Yeah. I mean, there are still people that see creatine and they're like, oh, steroids. No. No. <laughs> no. <You> know? <laughs> but, <laughs> I know. It just, it's one of those things that just won't go away, right? I, I mean, it's in skeletal muscle. I often tell parents, listen, you're, you're only topping off the gas tank. It's already in there. It's already a nutrient, right? And you, you might be adding 20% to what's in your, your son's or daughter's muscles by taking it directly uh, instead of having to eat 10 pounds of uncooked steak you know, to get this amount, but I know it's, it's crazy. So, yeah, no, I agree with you, Lonnie, because <clears throat> that's one of the things I look for too, is kind of where their mindset is at. Cause I don't want them running down the path now of, Oh, let me try all the weird, crazy stuff that even if it is safe and efficacious, we're talking about a one to maybe 3% positive input. And yeah. then they, you know, stop training and stop eating real food. And you, know, you don't want them to stop all the other habits like phil was saying that you've taken a long time to get that you know will be beneficial to them long term also so i i definitely agree of looking about what is their their mindset surrounding it right right on well, i mean that the you know, supplementation in general i mean that's even like with yeah. people losing weight i don't people are, what can i take to lose weight the right food and some exercise <laughs> you know i hate it when, well, and then it becomes a crutch you know, mm -hmm. yeah. like, okay, if little Johnny starts taking creatine for the wrong reason, now he only trains hard when he's allowed to take it. Right. You know, and, uh, yeah, so. it, that sh it shouldn't be his only motivation, you know. Yeah. Uh, speaking of different diets, next week I'm going to talk about one of my colleagues gave me an article from Time Magazine, in fact, it's on the cover, called Weight Loss Trap, and about all the different diets, because you just mentioned just eat well, you know, and how different people do well on different diets and that kind of stuff, but... Anyway, a little sneak peek, I guess. Um, moving on. This is from USA Today. So we got a lot of mainstream stuff coming. Uh, enjoy caffeine's buzz in moderation. It says a couple of cups is fine, but overdoing it can be dangerous. This is by Mary Bowerman from USA Today again. Uh, this is a pretty generic article, and for the most part, it's not going to be that informative to our listeners, but it brought up a question as I was skimming through it. Here's a couple of tidbits. How much caffeine can I drink a day? The answer, according to Robert Gladder, he's an ER doc uh, in New York. He says most people can safely consume about 400 milligrams of caffeine daily or about four cups of coffee. Now, I'm not sure why an ER doc is going to be the authority on this, but okay. Yeah. Um, maybe he's seen caffeine toxicity you know, from dumb kids buying powders on the Internet or something. Um, the limit varies from person to person, says Maggie Sweeney, a postdoctoral research fellow at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, K 
Caffeine intoxication is very uncommon, less than 250 milligrams per day, but over 500 milligrams sensitive individuals can experience the usual symptoms. And I'm not going to go down this list of, you know, the side effects of too much stimulant. I mean, if, if our listeners aren't familiar with insomnia or jitters or tremors or slightly elevated heart rate or whatever, um, that's what stimulants do, kids. <laughs> anyway, um, it's, here's the question. Because part of this, uh, first of all, it talks about how much to kill someone, and it says 50 to 100 cups of coffee uh, would probably be what it takes. That's a huge range because people differ. It says that said pure powdered caffeine can be lethal uh, in a teaspoon uh, if it's consumed all at once. The recommended dose, for example, would be less than 1 16th of a teaspoon. Uh, now, um, the question though, that came up was mixing caffeine uh, and other dangerous ways in, in, with alcohol – and how you might be falsely alert, and it would encourage you to drink more, uh, mm-hmm. and then you could actually, you know, overdo it. And I wondered about the gym in, in this case. So this is something that I just popped into my head when I was thinking about this. But could you say the same thing about the gym? Could you get so wired? Let's say you've got some mild injuries, uh, pre-existing, and you take, you know. Four, five hundred milligrams of caffeine, you feel really jazzed about it. You know, there's an element of euphoria with it too. It's not just stimulation, right? I don't know. Phil, what do you think about that? Like pre workouts, could it be possible to get too excited in the gym? Maybe you got pre- something pre existing and then you push it too hard? Just opinion. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess. I mean, the problem is it's not going to mask pain. <laughs> you know, and the way I see the, the the people that I've seen get injured from taking something is like a painkiller or something that masks an issue that they're dealing with um, enough that they harm it more. Oh, like an um, opiate or something strong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I I guess. I mean, if somebody got jazzed enough that they just attempted something well beyond their means, sure. I mean. Yeah. Or push themselves to a point beyond the means, but. And taking too much, like, I'm not, I, I take caffeine, I love coffee, I drink a lot of it, but uh, I don't like being shaky, I don't like being that lit up in the gym, it's especially a good point. lifting heavy, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to get under a freaking 700 pound squat bar when I'm already shaking, I'm going to be shaking once I get under it, so. Uh, it's a good point, more is not better, so everybody's got their tipping point, right, yes. and I mean, yeah, some of these supplements, I had a uh, kid last year brought in. He's a big uh, bodybuilder, football player kid. And it, the dose was 900 milligrams uh, in this Whoa. pre-workout supplement. I said, what? And he's like, look, you know, it was some off-brand pre-workout. And it's a good point, though, Phil. If you're sh- At some point, it's diminishing returns, and you're just in yeah. toxicity range, you know, yeah. overdose. Like my, wife has bombed, my wife has bombed out of one meet in her life doing Olympic weightlifting, and she got too caffeinated. Mm. <laughs> and it helped. <clears throat> It helped her clean and jerk, which yeah. is much more of a brutal lift. But oh. her snatch was she bombed out on snatch because yeah. she was just too jazzed. And yes, a little all over the place. You know, we presented so. some stuff just uh, two years ago that it, we we were separating the psychological from the physical benefits, right? And it, it, at some point, the higher doses, you continue to feel more and more alert, but the bar speed wasn't any better. So you felt yeah. like you were rocking, but you were you had plateaued. So it's yeah. interesting to me, and again, that was just one one little study, but that you continued to get more alert and jazzed, but your bar speed was actually not continuing to go up in parallel with that alertness. So, yeah, at some point, diminishing returns. Now, I know caffeine does have a mild analgesic effect because, well, you know, they put it in stuff like, what is it, Excedrin, or I've got a couple of doc okay. students, some, some physical therapy students, they're actually... Uh, toying with the idea of caffeine and coffee as a complementary therapy for uh, like total knee replacement rehab, you know that kind mm. of stuff. But yeah, to your point, Phil, nowhere near masking pain mm. like a, mm. like an opiate or something. Uh, what do you think, Mike? Um, pros cons about caffeine and can you push <clears throat> it too far? And yeah, I mean, I agree with what you guys said. And in general, right? So anytime you you start jacking up heart rate or getting more amped up, so to speak. Um, your gross motor performance can go up in terms of just acute performance. 
<clears throat> right? So this is why, in, in general, that's a generalization, but you see power lifters get more jacked up before big attempts. You don't see Olympic weightlifters doing that, right? Just because there's more fine motor skill involved in Olympic weightlifting than powerlifting. And granted, there's a massive variation. Some lifters do it way more than others. Usually it's more experienced lifters in general. Like you'll see a lot of people get too jacked up, especially when they're learning and everything just goes to hell. Their form just looks horrible. Yeah. Um, like you said, there's some interesting stuff with uh, adenosine receptor targets for pain. There's mm-hmm. one study I pulled up here from neuroscience in 2016. I know we've talked a little bit about that in the past too, Lonnie, that I've, again, it's purely anecdotal, but I've seen a few people get injured by using too much caffeine at the same time now, there's no way to say that that was the cause of the injury or maybe they were just using that as a crutch to push too hard in the gym maybe their nervous system is shot and they can't you know coordinate the muscles around the joint and maybe they've got more joint pressure or who knows there's not too much literature on it i was trying to find one other piece i think there's a couple of things actually in endurance athletes that have compared uh, aspirin to caffeine and looking at performance and analgesic effects. Um, there seems to be some slight effect from that too. So I would say they could, but I agree with what Phil said too. You know, a lot of times I think if you dig deeper, at least in some of the cases I've checked into, you know, they're using NSAIDs or aspirin or other things they don't want to <laughs> mention in order to yeah. lift at the gym and now you're talking about a completely different ball game at that point compared to coffee and caffeine um, last thing on that article too is that he said like 400 milligrams is four cups and that's like completely skewed right because if you can go to starbucks and get like their medium coffee i think is around 500 milligrams with a massive variation i think their grande is technically 583 or something right um so that's four cups is variable too so i even have i've gotten hosed with this with clients i'll ask them hey you know how many you know cups of coffee do you have oh you know i only have two so it's going forward for quite a while and i'm like oh nothing's adding up here so i said send me a a picture of your two cups of coffee well each cup was like 16 <laughs> ounces yeah i was like well that's a little bit more than what i was thinking send me so. a picture that's funny right yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's huge. Oh, this is my normal cup. I'm like, well, to you. 32-ounce 30, 30, <laughs> travel mug. Damn right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> no, that's funny. I, I like your observation, too, about especially uh, Phil's wife in the Olympic lifting. It's more yeah. skill-oriented, so you have a potential to screw that up worse, and I think, than if you were just uh, you know, um, training for mass, bro, you know, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, bro. Uh, you know, maybe this is subconscious when I – had originally thought of this idea, but I'm actually, I have a case study that I've been meaning to uh, submit uh, and it's myself. It's about my triceps tendon. When I ruptured my triceps tendon, I drank um, two grande Starbucks before then. And I had long standing tendonitis and tendinosis. And I actually think coupled the, either the force in, you know, the enhanced force production or explosiveness combined with, yeah, I probably had some aspirin or ibuprofen too or some of the analgesic effects from the caffeine. I do think it contributed to the day that I tore my, my triceps. Now, w- would that have let go eventually? Probably, right? But I'm just curious about what scenario led that tendon to let go on the day that it did, if that makes any sense. And I think that may have actually played a role uh, somehow. So, Yeah, and um, I pulled up online too. Starbucks Grande Coffee, it appears the median per – um cup is 330 milligrams but i've always seen it reported a little bit higher than that too so yeah i would think a grande um should kick your ass enough to get you ready for the gym you know yeah but yeah and we've talked about before where the amount of variation on that is freaking massive yeah like 100 migs or something yeah yeah 100 to 200 mig variation so yeah okay i have one last bit of um mail before we go to break here uh listeners we've been talking about other podcasters reaching out to be on the show and in fact um phil and mike know behind the scenes we have actually been getting a lot of requests hey can i be on the show can i be on the show and i don't think we're that special maybe they they just want to cross pollinate and I, but i think a lot of times we screen people for you right we kind of curate who's on the show because we're not going to have some shill come on here and sell his latest 
amazing new rules of everything, you know, kind of thing. But um, this one, I, I'm going to reach out to this guy. His name is David. Let me just read you part of the email. And I think he, he's going to have something to offer. But um, as someone who loves lifting weights and all the benefits it can provide us, I was thrilled to find your podcast a few months ago. I loved your recent interview with Ryan Smith. Uh, his thoughts on emphasizing injury prevention is a key message for people who love to lift weights. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and sports med specialist. I'm very passionate about sports injuries and their prevention. I'd love to come on the show and talk about steps that athletes and active people can take uh, in order to stay in the game and to stay healthy throughout their careers. Things like uh, how athletes can know if they should see a doctor about that pain, about the ache and pain. Uh, what treatments are available to reverse damage from injuries so we can train later in our careers or in our lives. Uh, ways adults and young athletes can improve their performance without necessarily sacrificing themselves in the process. If these topics are interesting, I'd love to uh, come on the show. Uh, keep up the good work, David. So that sounds okay to me, right? That's the kind of thing that I think as long as uh, I, I know he's got a new book and that sort of thing, and I don't mind him mentioning that, of course, as long as this is more about uh, tips for you guys as listeners and not just about hey i'm great here's my book you know <sighs> so and uh, could be good we'll we'll see yeah. and it's kind of uh you know we often talk about injuries uh it's hard to lift for years and years and not experience something so uh, i think i will be reaching out to him so cool. any, any other news before we go to break uh, we talk about the world's strongest man that we hit it on like <laughs> yeah uh, i haven't i've been Oh, I've been trying to avoid looking anything up on it. <laughs> oh well, I can you don't I can not be the spoiler if you want me to. Ah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> um, there was uh, what two points separated the top three. Oh, so, wow. Eddie Hall won. He did. Wow. Half Thor Bjornsson took second with fifth, and Brian Shaw in third with forty nine. Uh, so I predicted Thor like two months ago, and everyone said I was insane. So, but that's super close. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, well, I'm coming into day one. After day one, it was uh, Brian Shaw was only a half point out of first, and Eddie Hall was just in front of him. But uh, and then Half Thor was quite a ways behind. Oddly enough, Brian got killed in the plane pole, which is really usually like. It's usually a really strong event for him. He took fifth. Um, mm. The lightest competitor took first. Um, oh, wow. That's yeah, so the lightest competitor on the plane pole took first. Um, hey, Phil, what do you mean by yeah. light? Like 300 pounds? Well, yeah. he's still huge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Three yeah, you know, hey, no, he's a lightweight. So, Perspective, yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah. Where, you know, that's where Half Thor kind of took his... Uh, gained a bunch of points back because he took second eddie took third but um and then their huge deadlifts again brian took second eddie pulled 472 kilograms Ooh, uh, kilograms <laughs> brian 460 wow and uh i think the most surprising one to me was you know zavikas didn't do well at all but he was coming off that injury yeah and he, like the press he took last what he, in the press yeah and he's a huge presser i was gonna say uh, that's so, the opposite almost all the time. Yeah, he got two reps compared to like Eddie Hall's 15th. Whoa. Uh, yeah, so uh, you, you kind of know he wasn't at his. Yeah. His, I think the big one, I mean, there were a lot of people thinking that, uh, you know, Brian would take another one. And I mean, he had a strong showing. He never took yeah. you know, He never took a low uh, standing. I think his lowest was a fifth. And, uh, but yeah, it didn't, just didn't, didn't have it that day, but. Stone, just out of curiosity. On the stones? Yeah. Do, do, do. Let me roll down here and see who won it. Because that must have been pretty close to... They must have all been very tied by that point. Yeah. Uh, uh, Half Thor took first. Brian uh, took second. Oh, okay. And Eddie took fourth on that. Hmm. But he was all on enough of a lead. But, uh, so, yeah. Half Thor did it in 28.99 seconds. All five stones. Jesus. That's so nuts. Mm. So, <laughs> I'm just running through them. But so, Phil, I was just gonna. I was just thinking, what's the scale for listeners? So you say half a point, three points between them. 
uh, out of what kind of scale? I mean, is it a, like total points? Yeah. To, what's the total? Basically, it's it's you get more points for the higher you place. So let's say there's ten people in it. First place gets ten points. Mm-hmm. Second place gets nine. You know, so right, okay. But what if, were you talking total point spread between them all? Yeah, like, like you, who had the lowest on the day, sort of thing, or at the end of everything? Yeah, at the end of everything. Oh, it doesn't even it doesn't even tell us. It only shows us the points of the top three people. Okay. Um. Yeah, like at the end of day one, Ed Paul was in first with twenty six points, and Nick Best was in last with six point five. Okay. Yep. So, mm-hmm. um, and oh. if there's a tie, like. Let's say Eddie takes first, and then three people tie for second. Uh, they all get seven, I think it is. So right. basically, they're tied for that next spot, um, mm. and then it's up down. You know, so it kind of kills you if there's a bunch of ties. And yeah. Because uh, yeah, there were some ties on the early events. I think the first event had a bunch of ties on it. The squad, I think. Um. Now. Nah, Tire flip. Yeah, one of them had a bunch of people tie on it, but you know Brian won the tire flip, of course. Freaking eleven hundred <laughs> pound tire. Oh, uh, <laughs> but, oh nuts! So uh, everything yeah. is just so uh, out of range of normal human, you know, yeah. size. It's just crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, cool stuff. So that's kind of what I think on that. I'm gonna ch- see what I can find on YouTube. That's, that's fun to watch. That's even. I mean, I'm not that into oh, it. Oh yeah. But, um, well, if you go to Kale's website, go over to uh, startingstrongman.com. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then World Strongest Men results. He has videos of like all the top guys. Oh, okay. Event. So you can watch nice. like the top three in each uh, each event's performance. So yeah. I like the performance aspect. You know, it's just it's a little more heroic when people are that dynamic with the yeah. performance, and it's not just on a bench, something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, and those guys can move for how big they are. That's to me was oh, what's yeah. crazy. It's like holy crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, big and fast, dangerous, dangerous. Yeah. Men. All right, uh, all right. Let's go to break. When we come back, we're going to talk about supplements and strategies that work. Uh, and this time around, uh, for sleep, sleep aids. So we'll be back in just a minute. Hey, listeners. This is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you. Uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead. All that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, There is a book available. You can simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated Uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, There's an enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that. And uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single digit uh, royalty on the book. But that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. 
Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, folks, we are back. It's Phil and Mike and Lonnie, and we're going to talk about supplements that work, uh, diet strategies, any strategies, really. Uh, in this case, to help you sleep. I think it's one of those often forgotten variables. Uh, Phil, let's start with you. Uh, sleep's a big deal. Uh, do you ever have a hard time with it or with yourself or clients, and, and, what do you, and what do you do? I used to be a horrible sleeper, and um, – this was during grad school and shortly after and things like that. Mine, I think it was all stress related. Oh, <laughs> you start getting into oh, yeah. working yeah. a full time job and you know going to grad school and this that. But um, yeah, I mean, one of the big things for me is just relax. Try and relax um, before bed. Put down the put down the electronic devices and things <clears> like that. If I read a book or something. Uh, that help a lot and just, just kind of clear your mind. Mine, even today, if I have a sleeping issue, it's it's work related and this and that. It's because my head won't shut up. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep, yep. But, you know, as far as supplements that I'll lean to, I might take a melatonin here and there. Um, that doesn't seem to mess with me. If it's real bad, I'll take uh, like a NyQuil type supplement. But I, that stuff messes me up. Like the whole next day, I'm tired still. So I don't know what the half-life is in it, but it's long in me. Um, so you know, me too. Sure, like if, if I have a training day tomorrow, I would honestly rather just lack sleep and go train. You know, I went in and squatted big weights on yes, two or three hours. I, I couldn't agree <laughs> more. Yep. <laughs> totally agree. I, I don't know what it is, but it lingers on me too. Yep. Yeah. Weird. So, I, I mean, I would rather just lack sleep and go hit my hard training day than I will take that. But, I mean, there are times I will, okay, I got nothing going on tomorrow. I want to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's very rare. But, uh, you know, other than that, it's just, just making sure you're fed and hydrated. And uh, the big thing for me is just, oh, okay, let's take an hour before bed and relax. And, like, one thing we do now is we try and read to the kids. Um, so it's good for everybody. Yeah, it you is. Know, we'll shut off the TV. We'll shut off the devices and pick a book. You know, and that it does numerous things. I think it shuts your head up from the day's issues and this and that. You get your mind on something else, something fictional, especially if you're reading a kid's book. It's usually not not on the edge of your seat. Not challenging, right? Reading. Yeah, it's not challenging, and you're not like you know, you're not reading some kind of thriller. Yeah, you know that keeps you on the edge of your seat, and so. But uh, you know, that's the biggest for me is just is getting zen like, if you will, if you wouldn't think of me as zen like, but um, yeah. Yeah, you're a deep character, so yeah. The, 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 I agree. I mean, my wife would go on about, and Mike, you too, I'm sure, about sleep rituals and that sort of, and that's what that is, right? Oh, yeah. It's a slowing, calming, focus on something. Racing thoughts can really plague me too when stress gets bad. I also think it's worth pointing out to people, if you have a really hard time getting to sleep, not just staying to sleep, but early, like early in the night, you know, you just, you lay there awake, the this onset of sleep is very delayed. That's actually a sign of overtraining as well. But it could also be so many other things. You know, you, you were drinking some caffeinated pop in the evening that you didn't think about. I mean, there's not a lot of caffeine in there, maybe 50, 70 milligrams, something like that. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of reasons for it, I think. But overtraining could be one. But, uh, all right, uh, Dr. Nelson, I'm sure you have lots of fun things here. Yeah, so I think what you guys said about sleep ritual is <clears throat> really useful. Um, I played around with the very sexy looking yellow glasses off and on for years oh. and they do seem to help some people more than others. Um, there's some interesting stuff. Um, I've talked to a uh, sleep researcher, Dan Party, a little bit about this in the past that one of the things I found that's most beneficial for sleep is actually getting sunlight exposure without sunglasses during the day. Um, so basically that helps keep you more awake and also helps you then downregulate at the end of the day too. Um, so I find a lot of people who have sleep issues just never really get outside hardly at all. It's like light um, therapy, so just, you know. Yeah, right. And you see all the things for uh, season affective disorder, <clears throat> which is a little bit of a different thing, but just blue light exposure 
uh, especially in the, the back of the eye. There's special receptors there for the blue light itself. So I tell people just get up in the morning and go for even just a 20 minute walk without sunglasses or, you know, eat lunch outside, you know, things like that can make a, a big difference to trying to make sure at the end of the day, then your, your sleep cycles are a little bit better and not so dysregulated. Um, cause if they're dysregulated, you'll see that <clears throat> they're tired mid afternoon, a lot of times, and then they get a little bit sleepy in the evening. Oh, and then they wake up and they can't go to bed till, you know, two or three in the morning, that type of thing. Um, so having a sleep ritual, I think is good. Um, yeah, like two hours before bed, if you want to use some type of yellow glasses, you know, turn your lights down lower, um, the standard stuff, you know, make your room more of a cave, have it be really dark. I travel with earplugs and a sleep mask all the time now, mm-hmm. which uh, my last trip to Austin I found works really well. But if your place is above the bars, it doesn't do anything to stop your bed from vibrating at Ooh. 2 in the morning. Oh, wow. <laughs> that would suck. Um, that was a little brutal. But um, so I find that helps. Um, in terms of supplements, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit here too, I have used melatonin off and on. I think that I've played around – in the last year or so with actually lower and lower doses of melatonin. Um, so supplements I like now try to even get like a 0.5 milligram dose. Um, if people find that they wake up in the middle of the night, then I'll actually have them take a lower dosage of melatonin. Because if you take a pretty high dose, your body can then see that rapid decline and it goes, oh, melatonin's going down. Oop, must be time to wake up. Mm-hmm. Um, so paradoxically, people will keep increasing the dose and it gets worse. Um, dropping the dose a lot of times can be more efficacious with that. You know, I actually know a guy, Jeff, he uh, uh, owns a big supplement company, and that's his approach is, well, I take 10 milligrams. I don't, I'll, I'll take Ooh. two. Or, you know, he'll, he'll take multiple pills thinking more is better. And this guy's a physiology-oriented dude. I mean, he really knows his stuff, but... Uh, I, and I suggested what you and I had talked about, Mike, which is just that. And I really picked that up from you because I always noticed the three milligram dose, sort of three and five, I think, are most standard. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, but, three uh, is by far the most standard because it's easiest to manufacture, too. Okay, okay, there you go. <laughs> and three is pretty good for me, but sometimes I'll bite them in half. I'm not kidding. Uh, yeah. And I, because I will wake up like at midnight and be like, shit. You know, and you don't you don't want that going on. Uh, but I think melatonin, at least as far as effectiveness, I mean, it's legitimate. That's a legitimate like neurotransmitter hormone type effect on the body. And I think that if you find the right dose, it really can be helpful. So what else you got? Uh, one other one I think people forget, too, is uh, vitamin D. There's a pretty cool study that literally just came out May 5th, 2017, and uh, nutrient neuroscience, uh, the effect of vitamin D supplement on the score and quality of sleep in 20 to 50 year old people with sleep disorders compared with a control group. And it's always dangerous just reading the conclusion, <clears throat> but it said, yeah. uh, study shows that the use of vitamin D supplement improves sleep quality, reduces sleep latency, uh, raises sleep duration and improves sleep quality in people 20 to 50 years old with sleep disorder. Interesting. Um, so, Maybe interesting if you're really having a lot of hard time sleeping, getting your vitamin D checked is probably going to be a good idea. As we've talked about in the past, a lot of people tend to be low on vitamin D anyway. Um, I haven't seen much research on timing to take vitamin D. I know that some sleep supplements will include vitamin D in it. Um, I don't know. My gut feeling is I, I still take it in the morning just because I... I think we'll find that there is some timing effect with it just because we would normally be exposed to sunlight, which creates vitamin D as a primary source. Good point. And obviously, yep. that's going to be during the day. Mm-hmm. I don't think taking a crap ton of vitamin D at 10 at night before you go to bed, yeah, it'll get absorbed and yeah, it'll probably help you if you're really low, but I don't know. I just you know, have a sneaky feeling that we'll find timing with that in the future may matter more than we realize. It may. It's it's also a fat soluble vitamin, right? And so to me, Correct. those don't ebb and flow quite like the water soluble ones. Right. They uh, don't spike super high either. So right. Yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, let me just toss this in. Then I'm holding in my hand. This is calcium, magnesium, zinc, and it's made with vitamin D3. Just they threw that in as well. This is from Nature Made. I, I don't know if I bought this locally in like a Sam's Club or a Mark's. I don't know. But um, this says I take two of these because it's really low dose. 
So I'll take two. That gives me about a little over 600 milligrams of calcium. Calcium, for example, low, helps lower blood pressure. It's part of the DASH diet and things of that nature. So I think maybe that's why they throw that in. Um, magnesium, people know it has muscle relaxant qualities. So I get about a little over 250 milligrams of magnesium in this way. You got to be careful with magnesium. If you take over 400, a lot of people get diarrhea, mm. right? Osmotic mm. diarrhea. Yeah, especially if it's magnesium citrate. That's what they use to mm -hmm. clean you out before colonoscopy. Right on. <laughs> yep. And then zinc. Uh, it, it's about 10 milligrams worth of zinc the way I, I take these two pills. And it'd, be, it'd only be 400 I use of vitamin D, which isn't really enough to do much of anything. But um, cheap. And I, I tend to think it it's helpful. I, of all of those, I think maybe the magnesium uh, was what I was after the most, um, just because of the muscle relaxing mm -hmm. quality. Sometimes I'll have, like, uh, I've never been diagnosed with restless legs syndrome, if anybody's ever heard of that. But yeah. you just feel like you want to flex your quads and, you know, your legs are kind of um, itching to, to contract kind of and twitch. And, and I think I have a bit of that. And I think the magnesium helps. Um, I know my, my wife actually was prescribed magnesium. She was at risk of premature labor with our son, Logan. Uh, and the, the doctor is like, no, this is serious you know, medicine for reducing contractions and, and, and you know, crampy type things. Uh, people always think about potassium when it comes to that sort of you know, hypertonicity and whatnot and, and cramps. And, but the calcium, magnesium, zinc, uh, and then again with the added D from Nature Made, I thought that was, I don't know, I, I th tend to think that helps, but it, that's not very scientific, so. Yeah, and with magnesium too, look at the form, because magnesium oxide is what they put in a lot of products, because it's dirt freaking cheap. Right, yeah. And like yep. the <clears throat> conversion's only like 8%. So magnesium is especially one of those where the form actually does make a pretty massive difference. Um, but magnesium citrate's pretty good. Magnesium tarate's pretty good. Magnesium glycinate's good. If you're trying to get brain effects, uh, magnesium L-theronate is probably going to be the best because that'll actually cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, so with people I, that use magnesium, um, I use a, a product called MagTech uh, from Natural Stacks. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive, but it does have a little bit of the better forms of magnesium in it too yeah i was first introduced they were giving out freebies at a booth at a science conference i think it was called citra mag or something like that and not the citra cow uh, but yeah i tend to like the citrate forms of things as well but um i sh i would be remiss if i didn't mention l-theanine um i'm actually yeah. interested in getting more into combining this with caffeine because of its potential effects on concentration uh, memory and cognitive tests and things like that, but um, I'll take uh, a theanine every once in a while. The interesting thing with theanine is, I don't know if you've heard about those people who, they'll have a hot cup of coffee in the late evening to actually relax, and if you did that with mm. decaf, and you put some, t you know, uh, took some theanine along with it, like 200 milligrams of theanine, um, that would probably actually work, because it, it would provide the ritual, uh, calming down the warming without the the, the caffeine, but um, yeah, so theanine is a weird one, right? If you mix it with caffeine, it can help you concentrate apparently and, and perform on cognitive tests, but by itself, it tends to have relaxant qualities. I usually get myself from now um, pharmaceuticals or supplements or, or what have you. Um, I'm not pushing them. It's just 20 bucks, give or take, for like um, 120 capsules. Um, but yeah, theanine can be helpful. Uh, if we're going to go along some of these amino acid like substances there's GABA as well and I'm out of the loop with GABA a lot but I saw it on Amazon when I was looking for all these different related sleep aids and um, GABA amino butyric acid only 10 bucks for a hundred capsules <clears throat> of this stuff uh, and Mike I know you're always talking about blood brain barrier and whatnot but GABA the interesting double with this is that God, since the early 80s, it was looked at as a GH secretagog, something that would help boost growth hormone secretion. And you think, wow, that'd be great, right? Especially in middle age like I am, I'm not getting much of a GH surge during exercise. Probably most of any GH that I'm getting is happening uh, early in the sleep cycle. So I thought, man, maybe this will help. Uh, I found one paper from 2012 by Powers. Yeah. yeah. It's the only one I could find on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so why don't you... Uh, Share what you thought was interesting about that. Oh yeah, I was gonna say that the I remember that too, right? What is it? The old uh, 
twin lab, the growth field, didn't that have GABA oh. in it and like 12 megs of melatonin and right. Don't you know, doubt it. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, I was trying to follow that up too and I couldn't find anything other than everything I found reference back to the, uh, med and sports side paper 2012. Um, if you want to look at a pretty cool paper on GABA, it's in uh, frontiers and psychology, 2015, the last name is Boonstra, B-O-O-N-S-T-R-A. Uh, neurotransmitters as food supplements, the effects of GABA on brain and behavior. And, yeah, like you were saying, Lonnie, that <clears throat> it, while well, they cite a lot of the earlier work shows that it doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier, there's some other stuff showing that maybe it does. <clears throat> I know some functional med docs have used that as a possible rough screen to see if your blood brain barrier has been kind of destroyed, kind of like your um, gut barrier. Mm -hmm. So we don't want stuff from your gut showing up in your bloodstream, what they call leaky gut. So they'll sometimes give people a big dose of GABA and see if they feel anything. Yeah, not the best test. And there's really, I talked to a researcher at Experimental Biology two years ago about this. And there's no data that I could find looking at that, but yeah, maybe. Um, but in general, the GABA by itself doesn't appear to cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, however, if you change the structure a little bit, so sometimes you'll see 4-amino-3 hydroxybutyric acid or phenylbut. Um, that's actually an old drug from the Soviets, like in the 70s. Right, yeah. That actually has a phenyl attachment. Right, so if you modify the GABA structure, usually by attaching the phenyl group in some type of form, then you may get it to cross the blood-brain barrier. Actually, most of those appear to cross the blood-brain barrier. Or a phenyl paracetam is another one that they modify with a phenyl group. Mike or um, Phil, didn't didn't Louis Simmons start selling that uh, very I controversially a few years ago? Didn't he? Wasn't that one of his first supplements, so. Phil? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It's been kind of in the FDA gray area for quite a while. I think you don't see many people selling it now, so they may have cracked down on that a little bit. Um, I mean, I tried it in the past, and I have this weird thing with supplements. If they work too well, they scare me. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, which is kind of the opposite, I guess. But, yeah, that seemed to work quite well. But I noticed just anecdotally after a few days, it didn't seem to work quite so well. So I always get more nervous when... You see a, a big effect from it, and then you see that effect taper pretty quick. Um, I mean, obviously, it's an illegal drug, but like clenbuterol, you'll see that like your you know, body builds up a massive tolerance to it pretty fast, which to me, I think is probably the body's way of trying to protect itself, possibly. Um, but yeah, so I I don't use phenylbut with any people I work with at all. It just yeah, it makes me nervous. It's been around for a while. I don't think it's acutely dangerous but uh, I, don't yeah. know. I got a feeling that i wouldn't use super high doses is that it. the same thing as ghb mike i can't even remember i have just no, thought about this they're stuff. different okay but they're uh, all they're all analogs of each other isn't that right or are they similar yeah, gamma hydroxy butyrate yeah um, so yeah so uh, the first time i ever met actually dan party we were talking we we're doing shots of tequila <laughs> at two and three in the morning talking about <laughs> sleep research and ghb nice <laughs> <laughs> um so, yeah, GHB is actually fascinating. Obviously, it got pulled because it was considered, quote-unquote, a, a date rape drug. Um, but in in smaller doses, as long as you were very careful with the dose, it actually had some really interesting effects. It was very tranquilizer-ish, so, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and they were using it for people that had narcolepsy. It was one of the drugs that may help with that. Um, and for sleep stuff, it was one of the rare compounds that didn't seem to destroy sleep architecture. So, like, if you take Ambient and other drugs like that, they'll sort of knock you out. They'll put your monkey mind to sleep. But if you look at what's going on in your brain, your sleep architecture just gets destroyed, right? So if you've got <clears throat> people who have a history of using Ambient, a lot of times you'll look and their sleep, you know, duration may be okay. But at least in my experience, they have all the same symptoms of not sleeping enough. Because um, their sleep architecture is just kind of hosed. Um, so GHB, some of the anecdotal stuff, it didn't really appear to do that as much. But then it got pulled by the, the FDA, and so it got reclassified. And trying to study it is just a monstrous pain. Yeah. And then because of its classification, it 
you know, what do you do? You can't really release it as a drug. So it's kind of considered a supplement, but it's illegal. And so it's kind of a mess. Yeah, I'm reading. There's a legal brief here um, about Stephen Fawkes testifies to the California State Legislature Committee about GHB. And yeah, probably trying to keep it on the market as a supplement at this point. But uh, I mean, yeah, at the point we keep trying to bring it back. But and, you know, again, it's it's. It's like all things, right? A lot of drugs sometimes have biphasic responses to, you know, small amounts sometimes may be paradoxically stimulatory. Larger amounts may have more of a sedative effect. It's, you know, it's not always these nice, beautiful, linear responses to everything. You that's know, actually exceedingly that, rare. That, that's a good point, too, especially with the neurotransmitter kind. Because of, even this paper from 2012, this Powers paper from MedSci, um, they, the first thing they go into is how complex GH release is, right? There's yeah. GH releasing hormone, there's somatostatin, there's all these control. GABA looks like they're suggesting it acts on both the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Uh, but again, yeah, so these are all things that probably are um, sedative uh, in some way. It just, again, just we're not telling anybody to take any one of these things for God's sake. Just, you know, different supplements and strategies that... Um, you know, their pros and cons and, and things like that. Some some of which work. Like I said, I'm big, still a fan of stuff like magnesium and melatonin, helpful for me. Um, are we missing yeah, anything? One other, th one other thing, too, is there's been some stuff on uh, valerian root. Oh, yeah. Um, so valerian root, there's one study showing that it actually combines to the GABA type A receptors. And I think that that's how it may exert sort of the, the calming effect. Um, there was some stuff in the past about some liver function and that type of thing, although that seems to be kind of dismissed oh, uh, Mike, recently. Oh, Mike, I think that was with kava. The oh, liver was thing kava. was You're kava, correct. I think. Yes. Yeah, both of these You're relaxant correct. herbs, right. But I think that might have been, right, contamination more than, than, yeah. than the compounds in the kava itself, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so valerian root may, may help that, you know, sometimes. And if people want to go pretty far down the rabbit hole, there's a super cool uh, study called Sleep in Elite Athletes and Nutritional Interventions to Enhance Sleep. Uh, last name is Halson, H-A-L-S-O-N, uh, from SportsMed 2014, and they can get that as open access. But it's pretty cool. It goes into just different types of sleep deprivation, uh, effects of sleep, napping, uh, different interventions from carbohydrates to protein to... Uh, supplements, so they mentioned like tryptophan, which oh, you right. can kind of get again now. Yeah. Um, oddly enough, 5-HTP was never banned, even though that was the downstream metabolite of tryptophan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Interesting, right? Makes no sense. Yeah, uh, valerian, and then a couple other ones. Um, they do mention L-theanine, and I have used that too. Um, I find I need a little bit higher dose for me personally sometimes, but mm. I'll take that with some magnesium and a small dose of melatonin at night if I really have a hard time sleeping, and that seems to help. Even taurine has relaxed. That's, of course, taurine, yeah. you know, they'll mm -hmm. put some of that in energy drinks to try to reduce any of the jitters, I think, or something like that. But, uh, yeah, a lot of these amino acids... Uh, I, Again, we're just tossing this out, everyone. When I say things that work, I mean, there are things that almost certainly do, melatonin, like magnesium as muscle relax and that sort of stuff. But we're just encouraging you to go go study up on this stuff. Go see what you can find. Stick to the legitimate you know, sources you can. We're trying to throw out some facts and opinions here. But um, it sounds like, actually, there's a, a lot of options, and many of them are amino acid analogs you know, of, of one type or another. So... And last tip I have, too, is this, you guys mentioned about kind of calming your mind. So just doing, um, you know, any type of meditation or prayer or things like that can help. And then just very slow and long breathing, uh, especially if you can do it through your nose. So one thing I'll have people do is just lay in bed, take some nice long breaths, and then just see how little they can actually move in terms of airflow and just breathe through their nose and just think about air coming in and air going out. Uh, and sometimes that's just enough to lower their heart rate and give their mind something to think about for a little while and just to get them relaxed. Yeah, I have a I have harvested progressive relaxation and breathing meditation audio, like guided audio. Yeah. It was like 15, 20 minute from all around the web. I tend to go to .edu sites, you know, because they'll have like their psych department offer that for free. 
uh, you know, squeeze your fists, relax, and go through all the different yeah. muscles. Or like like you were saying, the focus on the breathing uh, that tends to actually help me quite a bit when my mind is racing. Because to Phil's point, with like reading a child's book, you're it takes some practice, right? But you, to keep bringing your attention back to your breath, it's actually very helpful. I think so. All right, fellas, uh, that's good. That's a pretty good roundup of different things to consider. And um, I guess we'll just be back next week. Cool. See you guys then. Have a good one. Hey, listeners, have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention, uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each Hall of Iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So. Thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.